Thank you for downloading Business Matters on air five days a week at 9 a.m. Singapore time and 8 p.m. New York time. If you're hungry for more, download our new weekly show, The Food Chain, a programme about the economics, science and culture behind what we eat and drink. Search online for The Food Chain podcast. It's one o'clock GMT. Hello, this is John Bithry. Welcome to Business Matters on the BBC World Service. We're connecting the time zones and we're live in Boston and London. Coming up, global stock markets fall sharply because of falling oil prices and renewed concern that Greece could leave the euro. The current euro story isn't working. And so something has to give. The question is, what is it going to be? Also, Las Vegas creaks under the weight of America's biggest electronics show. The New York immigrant who ended up employing his first boss. And does hitting the gym make you better at business? That's Business Matters. Pumping iron here on the BBC, all coming up after the latest world news. BBC News with Marion Marshall. Thousands of people across Germany have joined rallies for and against a group opposed to what it calls the Islamization of Europe. In the eastern city of Dresden, 18,000 people attended an anti-Islam rally. Jenny Hill reports from Dresden. We are the people, chanted thousands of protesters as they marched through the streets of Dresden in the rain. What was once the rallying cry of anti-communist protesters in former East Germany has become the catchphrase of a movement called Pegida. It claims to stand against what it describes as the Islamization of the West. And in a country where immigration's at a 20-year high, it's increasingly popular. But the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, has publicly condemned those behind Pegida. And last night, counter-demonstrations were held in 11 German cities. In Cologne, the anti-Islam march was called off in the face of strong local opposition. The retrial of Guatemala's former military ruler, Efrain Rios Montt, who's accused of genocide, has collapsed after his lawyers questioned the impartiality of the lead judge. From our America's desk, here's Candace Peart. The postponement of the trial dismayed relatives of the victims who have been fighting for years to see General Rios Montt brought to justice on charges of genocide. He's accused of ordering the army to carry out a series of systematic massacres in the early 1980s of hundreds of men, women and children. More than 1,700 members of the indigenous Ishil Maya people were killed. In 2013, he was convicted and sentenced to 80 years, but the conviction was later thrown out on procedural grounds. A member of the grand jury in the U.S. state of Missouri, which decided not to indict a white police officer after he shot dead an unarmed black man, has sued the prosecutor in the case. The unidentified juror wants to be able to speak publicly about the way the case was handled. The mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, has rebuked hundreds of the city's police, who turned their backs on him as he spoke at the funerals of two murdered officers. Many police have resented the mayor's expressions of sympathy for protests over the killing of unarmed black men by police. Mr de Blasio said the public snubbing was disrespectful. Those individuals uh, who took certain actions these last week, or last two weeks really, they were disrespectful to the families involved. That's the bottom line. They were disrespectful to the families who had lost their loved one. And uh, I can't understand why anyone would do such a thing in a context like that. I think it just defies a lot of what we all feel is the right and decent thing to do when you're dealing with a family in pain. I also think they were disrespectful to the people of this city. World News from the BBC. Stock markets in the United States have fallen in response to another drop in the price of oil, which at one point traded below $50 a barrel. From New York, here's Samira Hussein. In the run-up to the Christmas holidays, the low price of oil was taken as good news for U.S. markets. But now the big drops are being seen as a worrying sign by investors who are concerned about the strength of the global economy. These drops in the price of oil could indicate less demand and therefore slower economic activity around the world. 
The price of oil has fallen to lows not seen in more than five years, and the speed with which it's falling is quickening, with the price of a single barrel of oil dropping by 50 percent in the last six months. Earlier, the euro fell sharply against the dollar, hitting a nine-year low at one point, amid fears about the worsening economic prospects of the eurozone. The government in Pakistan has suspended plans to execute a man convicted of involuntary manslaughter ten years ago. Shafkat Hussein was only 14 when found guilty in a terrorism court. Pakistan's interior minister said concerns about the case had reached the ministry. Mr Hussein was due to be executed on Friday. The governor of California, Jerry Brown, has been sworn in for a record fourth term as the head of the most populous U.S. state. In his inaugural address in Sacramento, Mr Brown, a Democrat, promised fiscal responsibility and investment in big infrastructure and energy conservation projects. Jerry Brown first served as governor in two terms, from 1975 to 1983. The government of Liberia says schools will reopen in February, six months after it ordered them closed because of the Ebola epidemic. A government official said there were plans to distribute thermometers and buckets to all schools in the country. BBC World Service News. Hello and welcome to Business Matters. I'm John Bithry. Coming up on the programme, will Greece leave the euro after all? Worries over a Grexit drive the euro and global share markets downwards. Also, we're in Las Vegas at one of the world's biggest consumer electronics shows to hear what's trending this year more things in your life, in your home, in your car, whatever else will be smarter. Know, you know, your sleep patterns and know to wake you up more intelligently, whatever else. That stuff is definitely prominent. And does hitting the gym make you a better bet in business? And I'll be joined throughout the programme by David Friedman of The Atlantic, who is in New York today, and by David Kuo of The Motley Fool, who is usually in Singapore, but today he joins us here in London. How close are we to another crisis in the Eurozone? Concern that Greece could leave the single currency after an election there later this month have helped push the value of the euro down to a nine-year low against the US dollar. That's because the party leading the polls wants to reverse the programme of spending cuts and tax rises imposed on Greece by international lenders, meaning it could fail to pay back back some of the money it still owes and trigger an exit from the euro. Well, we are some people in Athens what they thought of that prospect. It's alarmism, possibly so they can steer us again, guide our vote. Obviously they'll play this game and of course we expect it. I don't believe that our leaving the euro would be that much of a problem. I think we'd be in the same mess. We're at zero, it can't get worse. We'll try to work and make things better. It's bad, very bad. This is like a type of fascism. It's like what we went through during the junta. Some views from Greece there. Well, major stock markets in Europe and the United States have closed down heavily, partly because of Greece and partly because oil prices have fallen yet again. More on that in just a moment. First, though, Pippa Malgram is an economist and the author of the book Signals. She was also a special advisor to US President George Bush. I asked her how worried we should be about Greece leaving the euro. Greece has already defaulted on probably more than 90% of its debt. So there's only 10% left. And even with that small amount, the Greeks have begun to realize that they are no better off. So the question has come up, well, what happens if we don't leave the euro? If we stay in it, probably we've got 20 years of this kind of economic malaise, slow growth, no hope, no opportunity. So people are saying, hey, maybe we ought to get out of here. And if they do exit, the fact is, then they would revert to some kind of a Greek drachma and it would immediately devalue. And Greece will be on the cover of Condé Nast World Traveler and every other travel magazine is the best place to go because suddenly it'll be incredibly inexpensive. That's how they would recover. The difficulty is that then this opens the door to countries leaving the euro. So I think the German position quietly is, well, Probably Greece does have to leave, but we can't say that out loud. 
But let's also try to bring new members in, like Lithuania, that's only just joined on January 1st. So then you can say it's fluid. Some countries join, some countries leave. It doesn't mean that the currency union doesn't work. What makes the position now so much different to that three, four, five years ago when people were so terrified about the consequences of Greece leaving? What's different now? Many things are different now. One is, again, there's so little debt left that the market's pretty well adjusted to that loss. That's less than 10% of the full amount. 90% is already defaulted on. That's the first thing. Second thing is that the debt is no longer in the hands of so few banks that it would have jeopardized those banks and created a whole new Lehman Brothers kind of risk where a single institution might have created a terrible problem for the world economy. The other thing is, I think that there's been so much work done to pull together the European Union with the new banking directive and all the efforts to align fiscal policy together more cohesively means that people are less worried that if a country were to drop out, that it would necessarily destroy the whole exercise. Would it not be an extremely messy process, though? No country has left the euro before huge efforts have been made to stop any country leaving the euro. We just don't know what will happen. And this is at a time when the European economy, because of the problems with Ukraine and so on, is already in a very precarious position. These things are always messy. But I think, what's the alternative? The alternative is that the countries that have cash in the eurozone, which is really Germany, has to keep bailing out and underwriting the Greeks. And the Germans just keep saying, no, we're just not willing to do it any longer. And they are demanding that the French, the Italians, the Spanish work much harder to fix their debt problem and their economic imbalances. And it's creating a lot of political stress. So, for example, in Germany, we now see more than 25 percent of the voters are in favor of Germany leaving the euro. So this isn't just a Greek issue. In Germany, what's been fascinating is the rise of the new party called the AFD, um, which is a pretty right-wing leaning party that's in favor of departing the euro. And they've gone from zero support to 25% support in a very, very short period of time. And the rise of the hard right on the continent is a you know, somewhat worrying phenomena that we have to keep an eye on, but it reflects people's concerns that the current euro story isn't working. And so something has to give. The question is, what is it going to be? Pippa Malgren there will be picking up on some of the points that she made uh, with my guests, David Freeman and David Quo, a little bit later on here on Business Matters. Now, though, wearable printers and smartwatch drones. OK, I might be getting a bit carried away with the tech talk, but it's only because one of the world's biggest shindigs for technology types is getting underway right now in Las Vegas. The Consumer Electronics Show sees some of the biggest brands around lining up alongside enthusiastic startups to show off the latest technologies that will, sooner or later, reach into all of our lives. Well, one of our regular guests on Business Matters, Ben Gilbert of Engadget, is in Vegas covering the CES. I asked him whether the show had changed over the years as much as the technology it shows off. The show has really changed over time uh, from something that was at one point dominated by companies like Microsoft and Sony and Samsung to something that is a little bit more diffuse. And those companies have largely moved away from CES because it's kind of a uh, hurricane of noise. And has that made the show better or worse, in your opinion? It means that throughout the year, we go to a lot more dedicated events for companies like Microsoft or Sony or whatever else that have largely skipped this event now. Uh, and it means that we have to try harder to, to find more interesting stuff, which is, in my opinion, a good thing. Uh, it means that we have to spend more time looking at smaller products from unheard of companies. Uh, it means that something like a prototype from Oculus Rift stands out more than maybe a, a big curved TV, right? And that's that's good because curved TVs are largely a gimmick and not really something innovative or interesting. And Oculus Rift are the headset guys, yes? Right, yeah. So they, they make a, a virtual reality headset. Oculus VR is the, the company and the, the Rift is their headset. And Oculus, despite the fact that they are now owned by Facebook, were at the time a, a relatively small company and pretty scrappy. And something like that standing out is, is great among the companies like Samsung or whoever else that are here. So is technology that we wear, is that once again going to be providing the headlines for you and generating the headlines from the show this year? There's a lot 
lot of buzz about stuff like wearables or the hard to maybe understand the Internet of Things concept, which is really just the idea that more things in your life, in your home, in your car, whatever else, will be smarter, which will work with your phones, which will work with your your lifestyle, things that you wear that might know, you know, your sleep patterns and know to wake you up more intelligently, whatever else. That stuff is definitely prominent, uh, and I think will be prominent for another several years at least as that becomes more mainstream. Okay, anything else we should be watching out for this week, Ben? Kind of gimmicky things. I, I specifically brought up the curved TV thing because I think that's a great example of something that's a gimmick and drives up price but doesn't really push forward anything uh, of value to consumers. Try to keep an open mind and look for the quirkier stuff instead of looking at the uh, the big loud companies. What, what, is the buzz, what is the buzz like in general there? It's not necessarily focused on any one thing. A lot of times when I end up talking to other reporters, you know, you you say, what have you seen that's cool? And the response is never necessarily, oh, it's this one thing that I saw. It's it's really varied from person to person. And so uh, for, for one person, that might be wearables. Another person, it might be the kind of Internet of Things concept. Uh, but it's, it's rarely stuff like phones or televisions, which you'd think would dominate uh, the conversation among journalists and attendees, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily. It's a lot more this, the kind of the, the weirder, smaller stuff. Ben Gilbert there of Engadget talking to me from Las Vegas and we will have all the highlights, all the headlines from the Consumer Electronics Show for you through the week here on the BBC World Service on Business Matters. Now, though, let's get a reminder of the main BBC World News this hour. Here's Marion Marshall. Thousands of people in Germany have joined demonstrations for and against a group that opposes what it calls the Islamization of Europe. The retrial of the former Guatemalan president, Efrain Rios Montt, for alleged genocide has collapsed. A member of the grand jury that decided not to prosecute a US police officer whose shooting of an unarmed black man provoked nationwide protests is suing the prosecutor. And US stock markets have fallen in response to another drop in the price of oil amid growing concern about global economic prospects. Thank you, Marion. Now, it's still the dream of many immigrants to the United States. Get in, work hard and build a life to be proud of. That's what one man who arrived in the US from El Salvador has done. So much so that when his old boss fell on hard times, Oscar Vier was able to help out. The BBC's James Gordon reports now from Long Island's New York. Oscar Valle was 16 when he arrived in America from El Salvador. He'd come in search of a better life and did whatever he could to find a job. And I always like to learn, you know. I, I always ask questions from uh, cleaning cars. I went to the cash register. Whatever I was doing, I always move up. It was in the mid-90s when business owner Phil Bono decided he needed some extra help with his own company and decided to give Oscar a chance. I put an ad in the paper for help and Oscar answered. Phil's company made and sold signs for those looking to brand themselves. The company would take orders and send them out. He came to me and uh, he was a young man. He couldn't speak English. And he said, I don't know anything about the business, but I want an opportunity. And I liked him from the second I met him. I kept him by my side through all my big deals. And any time I would do something, I would explain to him why I did it. I'd show him what I was doing. I just He took an interest, so I kept going with him. He took Oscar under his wing, despite having virtually no job skills whatsoever. I was asking questions, you know, always asking questions, and I was writing things down, and he was taking me to see customers, he was teaching me the business. Phil mentored Oscar for a couple of years, but their partnership came to an end when Phil moved to Florida. The pair lost touch, but more than a decade later, after trying some other businesses, Phil returned to New York virtually penniless. On the lookout for a fresh challenge, he decided to look up people he knew still lived in the area and gave Oscar a call. I called him and said, hey, and just said, hey, he says, who's this? I said, Phil Bono. He said, who? So I had to say it in his accent, Phil Bono. Are you serious? <laughs> I was so surprised, you know, he called him all, all, and then we started talking and he came and we talked and he told me, yeah, I was in Florida, you know, and then okay, it's only some way we can, you know, work together. During the time they'd been apart, Oscar had continued to learn and was now the owner of his own sign company that bore his last name, Valet Signs. He took an hour to show me everything he accomplished. I was so ecstatic for him. And he said, why don't you come work for me? The student had become the master. He was like, you got it. You don't need me. You got it going on here. And then another four months went by, and then I came to see him, and he, I said, what do you got? I'm ready. Sometimes a hard worker just needs a chance. 
what was it like for you to to meet up again after all those years, after everything you'd been through? It was it was great. I was happy for him to see what he accomplished because I know he came here nothing. He worked seven days a week at a car wash to just get on his feet. Twelve hour days, double shift, seven days a week. That's why he deserves this. This is where we do all work. This is a, he just bought this building. Two or three weeks ago, he closed on it. This is where we do all the manufacturing. We fabricate everything ourselves. 90% of the companies on Long Island, or even New York, call us to do their signs. Oscar not only owns his own sign business, he's building it into a national brand and is a multi-million dollar company. What's it like for you to see him succeed in this way and for you to be a part of that success? I couldn't be happier for him. I love him. I'm comfortable. We have a mutual respect, and I just think it's terrific. The pair have a unique chemistry and a partnership that appears built to last. A lot of people who see me, they surprise, right? And I tell them, this is the beginning. I was given an opportunity to come here, to live in this country, and I was given an opportunity from Phil Bono. All you need is an opportunity. Hard work, and don't ever get comfortable. Oscar Valle is the man from El Salvador and uh, a touching tale as reported on by the BBC's James Gordon. You're listening to Business Matters here on the BBC World Service. Coming up, more stories from around the globe, including storing fine wines and transporting priceless paintings, all in a day's work for one Hong Kong-based businessman. And is getting ripped in the gym the secret to success in the boardroom? Corporate success requires a pathological amount of motivation and discipline, as does building abs to a size that God surely never intended. All of that coming up here on the BBC World Service. Now, though, time to introduce my live guests in New York, David Friedman of The Atlantic. Hello, David. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and uh, delighted to be joined here in London, uh, this time round, by David Quo of The Motley Fool. Hello, David. Good morning, John. Good morning to you. Now, um, let me uh, go back to the story that we were leading on. Um, some quite drastic falls on global markets and in the value of the, uh, the euro uh, against the dollar today. And this is um, all because of problems, more problems uh, with uh, Greece, also uh, issues to do with the oil price falling further. Um, David Quo, on Greece first, how worried do you think should we be about the prospect of Greece leaving the euro, which is a question that we've talked about over the years and uh, so far it hasn't happened? I know. Uh, some some people say it's almost inevitable that uh, Greece would eventually leave the euro because uh, when you have a look at Greece, it just doesn't really conform with the rest of the eurozone. And it does that does feel kind of out of place. And you just think, you know, Greece should never really be there in the first place. Uh, some people questioning why it was ever allowed into the Eurozone, simply because it didn't really sort of comply with all of the rules. So uh, Greece leaving shouldn't really come as a huge surprise. What will be a surprise, of course, is how it actually does it, because people don't really quite know how, how a country can exit from the Eurozone. Mm. For instance, has it actually got currency in place at the moment that will allow it to uh, replace the Euro with the drachma? And also, uh, one of the big issues is nobody has ever tried to leave the Eurozone. And in the case of Greece, if it does leave the Eurozone, then maybe it is showing an exit for some of the other countries uh, that may not be entirely comfortable with austerity. So uh, how long is it before uh, Spain might decide to leave or Italy might decide to leave? Any country that suddenly decides that we don't really, really want to play this game anymore. And so therefore, I'm taking my bat home with me. And that is the big problem. And I think, you know, uh, the Eurozone will try its hardest not to allow that to happen. What about what Pippa Malgram was saying at, uh, at the top of the programme, The Economist Pippa Malgram? She was saying there could almost be a revolving door. Lithuania has just joined the Euro at the start of this year. Greece leaves, you come in, you play by the rules, you don't play by the rules, you, you have to leave and you have that kind of a scenario slightly simplistic, perhaps some people would say, with uh, with a currency block like the euro. But uh, well, 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 
if that situation were to happen, does it therefore mean that countries can actually leave whenever, whenever they want to and then rejoin again at some later stage? I mean, let's say, for instance, that Greece manages to get its economy back into, into shape again. Can it therefore then say, I would like to come back into the Eurozone and play that for a few years and then go, no, we're, we're not really happy with that. I mean, let's not forget that Greece uh, received a lot of subsidies from the rest of Europe as well, uh, from the rest of the Eurozone. So will countries be able to actually sort of go in, take whatever subsidies they need, and then after a little while say, you know, I'm not repaying, repaying this debt anymore, I'm leaving, and then uh, t- take everything that they actually sort of gain from the Eurozone without actually having to repay it. You cannot allow that to happen. David Friedman in New York, the Dow Jones is down by more than 300 points, not just because of Greece, but other factors as well. However, um, the problems in the Eurozone have worried policymakers in the US over the last few years. Do you think this will? Well, yes. And and I think the issue here, uh, just as David was saying, and, and I think everybody at this point is saying, is the fear of contagion. Uh, it, it's not so much anymore a question of what do we do about Greece? What if Greece leaves? Uh, I, I think that will be OK in the end. Uh, and everybody recognizes that. The, the problem is if others start to leave, there's, as we've said, there's no good mechanism for countries to leave or or enter uh, the union. And, and so the fear is that uh, this will create a domino effect. Uh, the, the world financial markets are incredibly interlinked. It, it's a very, very tight web at this point, And it's very, very hard to analyze. And so one weird thing happening that the system isn't ready to deal with can cause a tremendous ongoing problem. OK, uh, David Friedman also wants to pick up on this um, continuing fall in the oil price with you, the, um, the main US benchmark falling below uh, another symbolic threshold, $50 a barrel uh, for the first time since April 2009. It has recovered uh, a little bit above $50 a barrel now. However, this is uh, an extraordinary fall, isn't it? And it continues. Yes. And it's funny because uh, most of us, I mean, m- most Americans uh, hear, hey, oil, oil prices are finally down uh, to, to uh, you know, relatively record lows. And most of us are going, this is great. This is terrific. And in fact, it is uh, fundamentally good for the economy. And yet we see the stock market heading in the other direction, of course, because uh, large oil companies uh, are affected by this. So, I mean, this shows, I think one of the things this really uh, makes clear is that sometimes the stock market is not a good indicator of what uh, is happening in the fundamentals to the economy and what's happening with the public, where where the really the engine of the economy is. It's what people are buying and, and the public I think because of this is in better shape than ever. And apparently car sales have been picking up in the US because gas prices, petrol prices have been falling. Exactly. And and so, again, now there's a good domino effect here. Uh, we save money on gas and people are gas some years ago became a serious budget item for a lot of people. And so when gas goes down this much, uh, people have money to spend, and uh, and yeah, we can we can buy it on cars that that we don't have to buy the most uh, fuel thrifty tiny little cars either. So uh, yeah, so a lot of good things are happening, and and uh, the fact that the stock market's going down is a temporary effect. And we've talked a lot about the effect not just on consumers and countries that buy in oil, but uh, countries that produce it as well. We've talked a lot about the effect on Russia, and Nigeria, Venezuela, negative effects. Um, David Quo here in London, but you're normally in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore is actually an oil producer, which a lot of people may not know. Um, Is this likely to affect finances there at all very much? Well, people are very concerned about uh, the fall in oil prices, uh, simply because if you have a look at the Singapore stock market, uh, there are many companies listed on the stock market that are related, if not directly, then almost indirectly to the oil sector. So therefore, if oil prices were to fall, it means that the oil services companies uh, will probably find less work. Uh, you will find uh, re- retrenchment in m- many of the areas. You probably sort of, sort of find retrenchment in workers as well. So I think it is, it is going to have an impact, not only in Singapore, but also Indonesia, which is another big oil producing producing region. And you have uh, many of the countries around the South China Sea region as well. So I think I, I think it is going to have a, uh, a impact. I wouldn't say a devastating effect, but I think it will have an impact on many of those economies there. 
OK, David Quo, back with you in just a moment and with David Friedman in New York. You're listening to Business Matters from the BBC World Service. Remember, search online. There is a podcast of this programme that you can download and listen to at your leisure over breakfast or on your way to work. We're back with you in just a couple of moments after the latest news headlines with Marion. Welcome back. You're listening to Business Matters from the BBC World Service with me, John Bithry. Back with my guests in just a moment, David Quo here in London and David Friedman in New York. First, though, the business of moving things, physical things from A to B may not seem all that glamorous, but it is big business and getting bigger. American-born James Thompson left the US for East Asia in the mid-1960s and, after toiling in a few other jobs there, set up his own logistics company. That firm, Crown Worldwide, is now one of the biggest of its kind. And James Thompson is estimated to be worth the cool $1 billion. Well, James came into the studio earlier on. Well, Crown is a company that actually relocates people, uh, relo- relocates their goods around the world. It's an interesting story in a sense that in the 50 years that we've been in existence, the, uh, the globalization and the transfer of people around the world has become much more common. And so people now get up and go into new countries, take their families with them. And we have developed the business over those years as that industry has increased. So it's been quite a – being in the right place at the right time, being in the right business at the right time, it's been quite an interesting uh, business to grow into as the world changed, actually. In terms of what you do move around, how has that changed since you started the company up in the 60s? What, what do you move around now that you weren't moving around then, for example? <laughs> well, I think people have always uh, felt that they wanted to take their precious belongings with them in a new environment. If someone were going to be in a new country for three years or longer, they wanted to have their, their treasures, their personal possessions with them to make them feel at home in those cases. Most companies now allow people to take quite a lot of things with them. But it all varies depending on the location. People don't want to take a lot of valuable things to a sort of a dodgy country that they may be assigned to. And so they uh, it, it just depends on what they're going. But I think the whole concept is to make people feel at home, get situated in a new location and be productive in that new, new location with their families as quickly as possible. So I think now, nowadays it, there hasn't really been a change, but I think people now do take as much as they can with them because it's a pretty easy – Uh, exercise to transfer goods around. But you have got into new areas of business, haven't you? I was reading about your uh, fine wine transportation (laughs) storage business. Yeah, well, uh, once we've set up the global organization and we had warehouses and trucks and good, good people, we knew that we could do other things with it. So one of our second biggest businesses, which is not a particularly exciting business, but it's a very needed business, is the storage of business documents. So we're one of the leaders in the world in in retaining uh, business files, hard copy type thing, and, and electronic files as well. I was going to ask you about that. Has the cloud affected that at all? The development of, um, you know, we're being told paper is no more. And... You know, I've heard that. I've heard that for probably the last 40 or 45 years of my business life that there would be a paperless society. But the reality is that the internet has just caused an explosion of information to be available to us. And so much of it ends up on paper. And I have to say good copy machines make things so pretty to read that extra copies are made. So, so much of it still ends up in hard copy. Plus, there are legal requirements that still exist to re- retain certain documents and that sort of thing. So it's still a, it's still a growing business, believe it or not. But I, I understand what you're saying. That, the, But the other business we, we have gotten into that have been exciting, one of them, of course, is the fine arts logistics business. And we've been handling some amazing works of art in Europe, particularly the uh, the Girl with the Pearl Earring by Vermeer was recently we transported that. Night Watch at the Rijksmuseum. We even handled the, the Mona Lisa at one stage that, from the Louvre when it was not outside the Louvre but within the building itself. And we, we are constantly handling these priceless works of art. We feel it's a very specialized field and we also feel that art itself is globalizing much more than it has ever been before. And by that I mean 
uh, an exhibition of Picasso or something in the Louvre could easily end up on display in Beijing or some other country or some other city of the world. So the art is going to the people as much as it is, the people are coming to the, the museums. So t- talk us through how, yeah, the girl with the pearl earring, for example, how, I mean, how do you transport something of that nature? It's not, a bit more than just <laughs> sticking the, it on a plane, With isn't the it? greatest of care. I think all of these, uh, all of these types of priceless paintings and other works of art uh, are, are very specialized in the handling. But the museum curators are, are in the presence of that object all the time. We go in and we do the packing and we do the crating and the, and, and the transport, but at all times the curator or, or one representative of the museum is with it, even to fly on the airplane if it's going to a foreign country. The, the people who do it are so specialized and so good at it that everything is white glove treatment and very, very carefully done. So... Uh, we haven't had any uh, any problems or disasters. <laughs> that is <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> not yet, touch wood, not yet. Um, sort of taking that on and talking about China, which I know has been a huge growth area for your company, as it has been for so many companies, mm. fine art and wines, that's been a big, big growth area within those industries for you. Absolutely. Well, particularly the wine. We are in the wine logistics business. We don't buy and sell wine, but we, we, we store it. And uh, that actually has been a dynamic growth area for the wine industry. China, I'm talking here. And uh, the Chinese people, I think because they were locked up for so many years, once the doors were open, they wanted to uh, appreciate or be able to appreciate everything that they didn't have before. And that would have been fashion. That would have been wine. That would have been travel. And, and so as a result of that, they want the best of everything. So the wine producers, particularly the French producers, have had a field day in selling their wines in, in China. It's actually leveled a little bit at the moment, but it's still a big industry. Hong Kong is a particularly exciting place for wines because there's no tax on wine. The tax has been re- reduced to zero. And as a result, much wine has come into Hong Kong and it's become the wine trading center for Asia. And that's, of course, our key location. It's the headquarters of our company. So uh, we're in the right place for for that business as well. And it's exciting. I mean, wine is always fun and enjoy, enjoyable to uh, Yes, to everyone. To to transport and indulge in, in yeah. indulge in, indeed. In terms of yeah, you're you're based in Hong Kong and you've lived there for most of your life. Yeah, well, I've lived in Asia for fifty years, fifty one years actually, and I've been in Hong Kong for thirty six years. And and I would say, you know, in discussing this subject of development of a business, being in Asia and being in Hong Kong in particular is really one of the keys to the success of the business. I didn't foresee when I arrived there in, in 65 that a- Asia would open up to the extent that it has. But but about the mid-70s, about the time that uh, the Vietnam War ended and Mao Zedong and his group uh, passed away, there has been peace in Asia, stability in Asia and on all the countries. And with that has come prosperity. And particularly the opening of China in the late 70s when things started to happen, this has really made Asia the most exciting part of the world. And I think this is the Asian century that we're in right now. I think that right, we will see continued growth, prosperity, both of, in terms of production but also in terms of their buying ability. So being located in those Asian countries, which are uh, the place we started and the place we grew up, has been a big, big advantage to the success of our business. Are you worried about the geopolitics there? Are you worried about China becoming a a threat or perceived threat? I say, as I say, you know, the the peace has brought prosperity, and I like to believe that that's going to override all these little saber rattling issues that do come up. They they always make you a little nervous. It used to be Taiwan and China, and was that going to be a war? Now they seem to be getting along. But I think all the leaders that I have seen out there realize at the end of the day, whatever they may say in the media or publicly is is probably going to be overridden by the fact that they realize the good of all the countries is it's in their interest to to keep it peaceful and stable and work out their problems one way or another but a lot of the a lot of the rhetoric has to do with politics and keeping the people of their countries uh you know supportive of them as a party or as an individual and i i don't think it, or it really will result in any kind of 
major clashes, let's put it that way. So you were born in the U.S. What took you to Hong Kong? Well, as a young man, I was, uh, my father was in the Navy, so we traveled a bit. But as a young man, I, I took a trip around the world when I was about 20 years old. And I was, I was actually an aeronautical engineering major in school, and I got a degree in that. But uh, I was so fascinated by the world and the things I saw in Europe and the things I saw in Asia that when I finished school, all I wanted to do was go to Asia and soak it up, so to speak. So I took a part-time job there to... Uh, to survive, and that happened to be in the, the, the relocation industry. And after about a year and a half, I was let go from that company. And I, without any particular money in my pocket, I decided, well, why not start a company? And that's how it all began in uh, 1965. So, was it, uh, so it was a pull factor. It wasn't something that was pushing you away from America. I mean, it would have been, it was the glory days to live in America in the 1960s. Yeah, no, I, lo- I loved uh, my life in the U.S., but I have to say that the intrigue and the excitement of living internationally, and particularly in Asia in those days, it's something I I'm really feel blessed that I've had that opportunity to do that rather than having stayed in America and worked for a corporation and, you know, went up the ladder. I have had such an exciting life by being able to travel and, and get immersed in a lot of uh, the societies of different countries that I wouldn't change it for the world. I just feel I've, I've been the lucky one. James Thompson there, founder and chairman of Crown Worldwide. This is Business Matters from the BBC World Service. Uh, David Friedman is in New York. David Quo is here in the studio in London. And David Friedman, I know you like a bit of space talk. Well, we're going to go galactic again. And uh, you're rather uh, excited about this um, space X mission to the International Space Station tomorrow. This is the private space flight company who are taking uh, provisions and various other things up there. But actually, the real highlight could be back here on Earth. Tell us why. That's right. Uh, So in many ways, this will look like a routine flight. SpaceX, along with other companies, now has a contract from NASA here to bring cargo and crew. But one of the big costs of going to space has been the fact that after you get something up there, uh, all the very expensive complex parts that were used to get the cargo up there then fall back into the ocean never to be seen again. And what SpaceX wants to do here is actually have its large rocket, the Falcon 9, after it delivers the payload and sends it heading towards the space station, to actually come back down under power and land. And uh, safely on a barge in the middle of the ocean. This has never been done before. This is an incredible feat. Uh, they plan to do this tomorrow morning. If they pull it off, it could usher in a, a new age for rockets in space. It does sound absolutely extraordinary. I mean, this this barge is not going to be very big. It's something like 300 feet by 100, isn't it, or something like that. I mean, it's, it's a tiny area in a, in a huge ocean that they're hoping to guide this rocket down towards. Uh, That's exactly right. And and, uh, bear in mind, this rocket is 14 stories tall. Uh, It's going to be traveling at 1,300 miles per second uh, at at one point. So, uh, yes, it's a phenomenal feat. And and you really have to understand that, I mean, this is not like landing a plane or putting down a car in a pinpoint location. Rockets are very special. They're very, very hard to control. I mean, (laughs) rocket engines uh, release massive amounts of power and controlling it in such a way as to be able to put something down in a a pinpoint way it just people wouldn't even have dreamed it possible uh, 10 years ago so so this is really a big step but if you can reuse your rocket you could save millions upon millions and it could make um, space exploration a lot lot cheaper so that's the hope here And, and of course that was the idea of the space shuttle uh, th- which uh, which could fly a- and land on a runway, um, but but this is really quite a bit more ambitious. Uh, there were obviously a lot of problems with the space shuttle. Uh, we know how to make rockets uh, that usually don't blow up, although occasionally they still do. Uh, so yes, th- this could save a lot of money. Although it's interesting, uh, NASA is building its own rocket, the Space Launch System, for larger trips and hopefully to get a crew to Mars. And they're taking a very different approach. Rather, uh, instead of using uh, reusable parts. They just want to find ways to make parts more cheaply. Mm. So that's a very different approach, and we'll see which one pays off over time. David Quo. Uh, David, have they worked out what the chances of success are? I mean, uh, have they worked out what the probabilities of being able to land this uh, this rocket will be? 
Well, Elon Musk, who is the uh, founder and owner and, and who runs SpaceX, this is the Tesla guy, the famous Silicon Valley, Elon Musk, uh, he says it's 50 percent. Now, whether he's just trying to manage expectations here or whether he's being overconfident, who knows? I, we'll have a better idea tomorrow morning. So 50 percent means the flip of a coin, doesn't it? Yes, it uh, does. <laughs> it could land. Then again, it may not land. That, that, that's, a, that's about as good as we're going to get. It is. And, and of course, the Silicon Valley attitude is you don't try to you don't expect to get things right the first time or even the 10th time. And Elon Musk is pretty comfortable with his rockets blowing up. He's blown up a lot of them. And if this one blows up, well, so be it. Uh, he's just going to keep trying until he gets it right. Wow. Well, it's going to be very interesting to um, hopefully they'll have a camera trained on that. I'm sure they will to watch and uh, see exactly what happens. Um, both David's thanks. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Marion Marshall has uh, the latest BBC World News now. Thousands of people in Germany have joined demonstrations for and against a group that opposes what it calls the Islamization of Europe. The retrial of the former Guatemalan president Efrain Rios Montt on charges of genocide has collapsed. The mayor of New York has rebuked police officers who used the funeral of murdered colleagues to protest against him. U.S. stock markets have fallen in response to another drop in the price of oil amid concerns that the global economy is slowing. In early morning trading in Tokyo, the Nikkei 225 index was down 2.4% a short time ago at 16,990. And on the currency markets, one U.S. dollar will buy you 119.4 Japanese yen. Marion, thank you. Let's go to Australia now and the BBC's Phil Mercer, who is at uh, Sydney Cricket Ground. First of all, Phil, tell us why you're there. Well, this is the uh, first day of the fourth and final test match between Australia and India, and there have been uh, sombre tributes to the Australian batsman Phil Hughes, who, you may remember, was hit by a ball at this very ground on November the 25th. And for many of the Australian team, this is the first time they would have returned to the Sydney cricket ground for a match uh, since those terrible events that claimed the lives of Phil Hughes a few weeks ago. Interesting to note, too, that some of the Australian players in the test team today, David Warner, Shane Watson, Brad Haddin, the wicketkeeper, and Nathan Lyon, the spinner, were on the field when Phil Hughes was hit by that ball back in November, and there have been more tributes to the young batsman here today. OK, Phil, a very uh, sombre occasion. Um, let's head to South Australia and um, hundreds of firefighters still tackling some of the worst bushfires to, heat, to hit South Australia for more than 30 years. What's the, what's the latest? Well, the South Australian Premier is Jay Wetherill and he is warning that the next 24 hours in that particular part of Australia promise to be extremely dangerous. Strong winds and very hot temperatures approaching 40 degrees Celsius are forecast for the fire zone. This is uh, to the east of the city of Adelaide. Uh, several homes have already been destroyed or badly damaged and the fires have hit communities in the Adelaide Hills. And you're absolutely right, these fires are said to be the worst that South Australia has endured in 30 years and of course there are huge economic costs associated with these very severe bushfires not only to the loss of property but livestock and crops and also to damage to infrastructure such as power and water supplies. So Australia is a country well used to natural disasters but these fires have been particularly savage in the state of South Australia. Yes, indeed. And uh, one other story, Phil, I know you've been uh, looking at as well, which is uh, allegations that foreign backpackers are being exploited on Australian fruit farms. And I know that this is uh, uh, what a lot of backpackers do when they go to Australia. It's the, uh, some, amongst the only places that they can actually work for a temporary period of time. Tell us, tell us what the story is. Well, Australia has uh, a very generous working holiday program for uh, young people aged between 18 and 30 from various countries, Belgium, Japan, the UK and Italy. 
to name a few, and they are granted one-year working visas with options on a second year. And federal authorities are investigating a businessman in the state of Victoria over allegations that he's exploiting young backpackers in the fruit-picking industry, paying them allegedly as little as 50 cents an hour, forcing them to live in garages. And these are very serious allegations against this particular businessman. And uh, given that so many young backpackers do make a beeline to Australia, especially at this time of the year during the warmer summer months, this is uh, of great concern not only to Australia, but of course to the family and friends of all of those young people who come from around the world to visit Australia for one or two years. OK, Phil Mercer, the BBC's Phil Mercer, joining us from Sydney. Thank you very much indeed. Now, have you made any New Year's resolutions, pledges to improve yourself and your life in 2015? Well, if you've made any at all, they probably include eating a bit less and exercising a bit more. Pumping iron in the gym is a favoured pursuit of many business types, but does the physical pain lead to financial gain? It's something that Lucy Kellaway of the Financial Times has been pondering. Harriet Green, the former chief executive of Thomas Cook, who quit unexpectedly last month, likes to start her day in the gym at 5.30am, hefting 16 kilo kettlebells, and has energy that even her personal trainer can't match. She has always maintained that there was a link between the punishment she exerts on her body and the bottom line of her business. She builds strength in the gym which is just what is needed to run a company. Executives have long boasted about the rigour of their gym routines, but this extreme exercise fad is getting out of hand. As business gets more competitive, we all talk of the need for companies to be lean and fit, agile, flexible, and even to sweat the small stuff. But do we really mean the bodies of their leaders must fit the same description? In a limited way, exercise helps us to perform at work. When I get up off my bottom and climb the stairs, I feel a bit less sluggish as a result. But to achieve this pleasant state of perkiness, there's no need for excessive exertion. According to the National Health Service website, all you need is to go for a shortish, briskish walk five times a week. And even this amount of activity isn't a prerequisite of dazzling business success. The two leaders I most admire are both on the heavy side and I've never known either to take any exercise at all. Each has a large body that houses an exceptionally large brain. They both seem to have plenty of stamina for running big, complex businesses, both take good decisions and are much looked up to by the many thousands of people that work for them. It's true that these are exceptions. There are far more fitness fanatics than fatties in corporate boardrooms. Yet the reason isn't that extreme exercise causes extreme success, more that both are the result of the same personality defect. Corporate success requires a pathological amount of motivation and discipline, as does building abs to a size that God surely never intended when he fashioned Adam and Eve from clay. The only pity is that such discipline is wasted on something so inward and pointless. Almost anything will be better, learning to play the violin, reading a book, or even going shopping, as at least you would be giving the economy a boost. Sport does not broaden an executive's worldview. Virtually everything else does. Not only is excessive exercise not necessary for success, it's a bad idea for lots of reasons. It's terrible for families, as if you work long hours and then exercise long hours you never really see them at all. It's also discriminatory. People who sweat together form a bond that excludes other people. It's no coincidence that Ms Green chose to fill her top team at Thomas Cook with a marathon runner, a triathlete and a former gymnast. It makes most people not just feel superior, but invincible in a way that can be dangerous. Only the paranoid survive and all that. But above all, it's boring. People who go on about their fit bits are excruciatingly dull. Finally, excessive exercise can be bad for your bones. But that's one argument that I don't want to stoop to using. If executives choose to mess with their skeletons in this way, let them. 
It's none of my business. This is Lucy Kellaway for the BBC World Service. So back to the two Davids, David Friedman in New York, first of all. Want to tell us about your Fitbit? <laughs> no, that's very personal. Uh, <laughs> okay. But I, I, I agree with everything Lucy said. But I, I would just say, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater here. As Lucy points out, you don't need to do a lot of exercise. I really would love to see more people doing a little bit of exercise all the time. It'll work wonders for their health. I doubt it will do much for their business acumen. But uh, hey, who knows? Maybe there's a bonus there. What about what she was uh, saying there? I mean, Lucy Kellaway is obviously not a particular fan of the gym or sport in general. I think that's quite clear. But uh, uh, discipline, um, it lends itself to uh, corporate success. And it also, obviously, you need discipline to, to get fit and keep fit. Are, are there parallels? That, you know, are they basically complementary? Yeah, well, scientists like to say that uh, correlation is not causation. You, just because you see two things that seem to be linked doesn't mean one is causing the other. And so, yes, the same kind of type A personalities who are aggressive and motivated and disciplined, sure, they, they want to, by and large, get to the gym, get bigger, get stronger, uh, be be better than somebody else. They're very competitive. And, and I think that makes a lot of sense. It, it doesn't mean that their exercise in any way is helping them with their business. But yes, I think the two things often go hand in hand. But look, for the rest of us who may be a lot more low key, such as us creative writer types, uh, <laughs> I, we, we need to exercise, too. So let's not uh, let's not fall on that as an excuse. Well, indeed, people from all walks of life are indeed allowed to exercise. Um, David Quo, uh, what do you think of uh, what Lucy Kellaway had to say there? I mean, in a way, sport and capitalism, fitness and capitalism, they, they go hand in hand, don't they? Well, up to a point, you know, I, I I'm one of these people that likes to exercise privately. I don't really like to exercise in front of other people. And I do remember joining a gym once. And my experience of a gym is that people just hang around the, the, the water cooler, spending most of the time uh, talking rather than actually exercising. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I prefer the, the low-cost way of doing it now, uh, carrying sacks of potatoes from the supermarket to the car. That's pretty good. If I really, if, <laughs> so all, the, all of that, what, five metres? <laughs> <laughs> and if I really want to do something really energetic, I think what I do is I strap a couple of bags of sugar to my feet and I walk around the house that way and that helps to exercise the muscle. So you don't really need to spend an awful lot of money in order to try and get uh, get fit. Right. So do you do you is that really all you do in terms of exercise? Do you do any? I mean, you're a svelte looking chap. Are oh, you're you? very kind, John. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 very do walk, I, I do walk a lot. And in Singapore, you know, it is almost like a sauna anyway. So wherever you walk, I mean, I you walk for about a couple of hours. And, and that's right. That's better than, than, than any gym or any sauna. OK, David Quo, thanks for being here in the studio in London. David Friedman in New York City. Thanks to you as well. This has been Business Matters with John Bithry. Don't forget, there's a podcast search for BBC Business Matters. You can listen to it on your way to work in the morning. Bye-bye. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.